Mega Constellations. They're one of the parts of the space and space exploration field which simultaneously draw the most excitement and also concern from the spaceflight community. I mean, you've got tons of SpaceX fans saying that Starlink is going to fund the future and Mars colonization. While on the other hand, you've got tons of people raising red flags about how the proliferation of mega constellations could make operations in Earth orbit become prohibitively expensive and hazardous. In today's video, I'm going to look at both sides, give you a rundown of the mega constellation scene, and give my own thoughts on what should be done and how we should approach the legitimate problem of mega constellations. First of all, we have to ask ourselves why are mega constellations becoming such a popular item nowadays? And I think the big reason boils down to launch costs being significantly lower. Before, when you had a satellite constellation, a huge consideration was the launch costs of getting into orbit, especially because a lot of these satellites were going into geostationary transfer orbits, the launch costs were really high. So, a lot of companies like DirecTV took an approach of building very expensive satellites that could in turn serve very large regions through their geostationary orbit location and high technology and throughput. And this is a completely alternate philosophy to what mega constellations are offering. While direct TV satellites cost $200 million to build, a SpaceX Starlink satellite costs less than $100,000. Which is a good thing if you're SpaceX and planning on launching 4,000 Starlink satellites just for your first phase, and 30,000 satellites for your second phase, which is almost certainly not going to happen without Starship. And while Starlink has the most satellites in orbit by far, it does have one competitor that's actually put stuff in orbit, and that's OneWeb, which actually went bankrupt last year, but it got saved by the British government and an Indian telecommunications firm, and is still launching its satellites. And it's got about 146 of them up there right now, with a launch just happening recently out of Vostochny on a Soyuz. They've also downsized their planned constellation size from 48,000, which is admittedly pretty ambitious, to 7,000. And it looks like they're going to be especially relevant in the polar regions, where they hope to open service before Starlink. And although I'm somewhat dubious of their ability to compete with Starlink, I do think they'll at least have a limited use case in some scenarios. Now, I think the most potent challenger to Starlink in the commercial internet market is going to be Kuiper, which is Amazon's, not Blue Origin's, answer to the satellite internet mega constellation. They're going to be launching 3,236 satellites into orbits between 590 and 630 kilometers in order to provide internet for underserved communities, and especially with Amazon's offerings through Amazon Web Services and the Amazon ecosystem, I think this is going to be a huge competitor to Starlink just because of Amazon being Amazon. And although they had to buy nine ULA launches, which was admittedly a little painful to read, building a mega constellation on an expendable high cost vehicle like the Atlas V. I do suspect there was a little bit of politics involved. Maybe this was Jeff Bezos' way of saying, I'm sorry to Tory Bruno and ULA because of the BE4 screw ups. But whatever the politics behind the decision may be, there's also a real reason why Kuiper needs to get their satellites launching now. In order to maintain network authorization from the FCC, they need to have at least half of their constellation in orbit by mid-2026. And while it may take a while to get them launched on Atlas V's, they need to start working on it. Hopefully New Glenn can come around with a fast launch cadence and pick up a lot of the slack. And America isn't the only actor with a hand in the mega constellation pot. China's been eyeing America's progress and was initially planning on the Hongyan and Hongyun satellite constellations, but has now just recently decided to launch the integrated Guoweng satellite constellation, which will provide broadband internet and communications to China and maybe other nations that want to sign on through the Belt and Road Initiative. This, along with their recently finished Baidu constellation, gives China a powerful counteroffer to Western advancements in space. While a lot of the conversation in mega constellations has been focused around satellite communications and internet, there's also a significant portion of the field that's dedicated to imagery and other functions. 
You've probably heard of Planet Labs, which is a company with over 150 satellites in operation, most of which are 3U CubeSats called Doves, which can provide 3 to 5 meter resolution on demand of anywhere in the world. This can be used for national security analysis, for environmental research, and for city planning and agriculture. They've got tons of uses and they're really popular among a lot of different sectors. They've also got the SkySat constellation, which can provide sub 50 centimeter resolutions and are about the size of mini fridges. They've got 21 of these satellites in orbit and I'm interested to see what Plan Labs is gonna come up with next. There's also the field of synthetic aperture radar. It's a technology that uses microwave pulses and the reflections in order to get accurate data on the surface, regardless of visibility, and can also distinguish between foliage and various different kinds of textures on the planet's surface. This is extremely useful for agriculture, national security, and especially environmental monitoring. Capella Space is a company seeking to make a name for itself in the SAR field, and they recently launched a tech demonstrator on the Rocket Lab Can't Believe It's Not Optical flight. And as if all this commercial interest wasn't enough, the US government is also showing a ton of interest into the Mega Constellation model. The Missile Defense Agency has granted $130 million for the creation of a hypersonics tracking constellation that would allow the US military to target and destroy hypersonic threats to the US and its allies. This, along with the Blackjack Imaging Constellation, which plans to have 90 satellites in orbit by 2022, are signs that the US government is seeing the value in the Mega Constellation model. And this, I think, is because the US government recognizes the vulnerability of in-space assets, and the fact that anti-satellite missiles cost on the order of millions of dollars, while spy satellites can range in the billions. So it's much cheaper for an adversary to invest in anti-satellite capabilities and significantly undermine US capabilities. The Mega Constellation model would allow for rapid replenishment of spy satellites in the case of an attack, and would also allow flexibility in the way the US responds to threats, giving the US an unprecedented level of analysis and real-time data, which can only be a good thing. After all, we want the people making policy decisions fully informed and aware of the risks and results that could come with any potential action. So by now, with all the things I've just told you, I hope I've made it clear that Mega Constellations are here to stay. With that though, I want to get into the risks of Mega Constellations, especially when it comes to orbital debris, which I've constantly seen cited as a huge threat to operations in low Earth orbit. And I think this is one domain where regulators actually have a very crucial role to play. I know regulation has gotten a bad rap, especially with the FAA shenanigans at Boca Chica or Starbase, whatever it's called nowadays, but they do have a crucial role to play when it comes to managing low Earth orbit. With the Iridium Cosmos collision and several other breakup events causing the increase in space debris, we're seeing not satellites, but space debris. And I think this is what a lot of articles are missing. It's not necessarily the satellites that are the threat to low Earth orbit, because satellites can maneuver, but debris can't, and a lot of debris is small and untracked, unlike satellites. The linchpin to any good space debris framework is tracking. You need to be able to know what threats are present in space and how best to avoid them because spacecraft have limited maneuvering resources and therefore should only move when it's absolutely necessary to ensure long-term survival. But there's also a key role to be said about ensuring operators can maintain control of their spacecraft, which also fits well with ESA guidelines to deorbit your spacecraft and satellites within 25 years. And the good news is that most mega constellations are well within that safety limit. Luckily, Starlink is mostly operating in the 500 km to 600 km band, which should allow them to deorbit naturally within 5 years. I think it also has to be said that Kessler Syndrome won't happen overnight. There won't be a day when we suddenly can't go into low Earth orbit anymore. Rather, it's going to be a slow, slow degradation of the environment in low Earth orbit that makes it more and more expensive and risky to engage in low Earth orbit operations. 
Therefore, it's in companies like SpaceX's and Blue Origin's interests to ensure that LEO remains a viable destination for commercial spaceflight because they are commercial spaceflight and they will benefit from a safe environment for future sustained operations. The other big issue I see people raise about mega constellations is astronomy, especially land-based long exposure astronomy, which relies on pointing a camera at the sky for a long period of time and collecting as many photons as possible. The problem is, while you're recording for a huge amount of time, the chances are increasing that a satellite crosses through your frame, and if it's bright enough, it'll wash out the 16th magnitude galaxy you're trying to take a photo of. And as an amateur astronomer myself, I've been kind of frustrated by the reaction of many in the spaceflight community, which kind of just ridicule astronomers for these concerns. They are valid concerns. I don't think you should stop mega constellations over this, but I think the road SpaceX is taking by adding visors to their satellites and decreasing their albedo is a great way to show that they're taking into account the advice of the scientific community and looking to make life easier for astronomers. In the end, I think mega constellations are going to be a huge cash cow for the space sector, and especially SpaceX. But we can't lose sight of the importance of taking into account debris mitigation and the requests of the scientific community, while keeping in mind that mega constellations and satellite internet have the potential to revolutionize the way many people lead their lives and lead to a significant improvement in the quality of life of billions of people. But that's no excuse for carelessness. If this can be done right and done sustainably, then it can be a sign to everyone that space isn't just the playground of billionaires and governments, but it's a place where companies and people can make life better for everyone. With that, I want to thank everyone who subscribed and shown support to my videos in the comments. If you guys have any ideas for video suggestions or topics and improvements for this channel, feel free to let me know in the comments below. This is Cost Plus Content, signing off.